Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, of course, a very great honor for me to be uh, invited back to Melbourne uh, to give this uh, very prestigious oration. Thank you, Kate, and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I have, in fact, been reading your wonderful report on the ch uh, work of the Commission and the charter that you have in Victoria, and it uh, did make me feel rather envious because, of course, you really are leaders in Australia because you think about the law by reference to the Charter of Human Rights, whereas I'd have to say the rest of Australia does not, and that, in a way, underpins what I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, it is wonderful to be here on this glorious Melbourne day uh, by the river, seeing the boat, boat houses out there, um, and I, of course, uh, pay my respects and acknowledge the land of the Kulin people and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Well, as Australians, we have emerged from the rather surprising uh, G20 meetings. And during those meetings, I had the wonderful opportunity to listen to the German Chancellor, Anger Merkel, giving a lecture. And she anchored her speech in the importance of the international rule of law, democracy, and human rights. Not entirely surprising, given, of course, uh, that the Russians are lingering uh, with evil intent on the borders of Ukraine, something that she sees as absolutely uh, a threat to the European Union. But at almost exactly the same time, the chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs in Australia said, listening to evidence, I might add, in relation to new legislation introduced uh, with great speed uh, before Christmas, he said, Australians don't care about treaties or international law. And he continued, the aim of the amendments to the Maritime Powers Act and the Migration Act is to stop the High Court interfering with government asylum seeker policy. The contrast in approaches of senior leaders to international human rights law was stark and very disturbing, and particularly disturbing for me that several bills have recently been introduced to Parliament in this last session that propose an unprecedented increase in executive discretion by the federal government, often ousting the jurisdiction of the judiciary and excluding international law and human rights. Indeed, the threat posed by the overreach of executive discretion has long been recognised, and in particular by our former Chief Justice Dixon in 1952, who observed that democracy is at risk of being taken over by the executive, following, in that case, the Communist Party case that was decided the previous year and before Justice Dixon had joined the court. Today, I'd like to explore the admittedly lofty ideas of the limits of executive discretion in the context of three important human rights issues. The long-term imprisonment of those who are mentally unfit to plead to criminal charges, the indefinite mandatory detention of asylum seekers, and the new and now proposed counter-terrorism laws. But let me begin with a foundational idea of the common law. As you all know, next year we celebrate the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta, signed very reluctantly by King John on the fields of Runnymede, forced by his uh, feudal barons. And I don't know whether many of you have ever taken the time to look at this. Perhaps uh, you might have done in law school. But it's worth a look, given that we're going to be talking about it so much uh, in, in the next year. But buried in the middle of this constitutional document that set the volume for a glass of wine or for, or, for, or for ale and the property rights of a widow on the death of her husband is the following clause. No free man is to be taken or imprisoned or deceased of his liberties or in any way ruined save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. To no one will we sell or deny or delay right or justice. Well, these words ring through the centuries and the right not to be detained arbitrarily is reflected in every common law and civil law system in the world. The idea that the executive government of a state may not detain a person without judicial process is not the recent invention of, of new states at the United Nations. Rather, it's a guarantee of ancient lineage that virtually every democratic legal system in the world recognizes as the sine qua non of nationhood. Yet today in Australia, we detain people under the broad right of the executive to detain for administrative purposes. The first example I'd like to look at 
uh, is one that really isn't discussed or even understood very much, and that's the detention of those with a mental illness or disability. And I'd like to show you a particularly egregious example that concerned a man called Merlin, who was held for over 10 years without a trial and without a charge in Western Australia in circumstances in which the evidence of a criminal offence was virtually non-existent. Merlin was found unfit to plead in response to a sexual assault uh, in relation to which the two girls alleged to have, um, uh, who, who alleged the assault were unaware that they'd ever alleged the, uh, the, this allegation and where the mother of the two girls was also unaware that it had ever been made. So he was found unfit to plead. He was found not eligible for full psychiatric support but also not eligible to be released into the community and then was held in a criminal prison uh, for, uh, in solitary confinement for much of that time for 10 years. Uh, and one of the things that we do at the Australian Human Rights Commission in Sydney is to produce these video clips because they do have a powerful capacity to explain to people just what the human dimension is when we otherwise talk about evidence and statistics. So if we could just quickly have a look at it. At the age of 19, Marlon's life took a drastic turn for the worse. He was charged with sexual abuse of two girls. Um, and one had an intellectual disability and the other didn't, and they were Aboriginal girls. I mean, friends of the whole family. Friends of the family. From the very beginning, Marlon denied doing anything wrong. But due to his disability, he was deemed unfit to stand trial. That left him in a legal grey area. All right, that's cut out and it doesn't look as though we're going to be able to see it. No, okay, something's gone wrong. doesn't matter. Basically, the story, he's a charming man. Uh, he's now been released, and he can't even walk down the road without a minder with him. Uh, but nonetheless, he's at least in the, in the community, and so you see him there peeling carrot. But the, the core point is that uh, he's a young Indigenous man, uh, held for a long time, um, and uh, uh, really has deeply suffered as a consequence, and only discovered by uh, pro bono legal aid lawyers who uh, found out about the case and then pursued it and had a look at the evidence. But much more recently, the Australian Human Rights Commission has considered complaints against the Commonwealth for failing to ensure that four Aboriginal men, again with intellectual disabilities, were accommodated in facilities other than maximum security prisons or that they received appropriate medical or other support. In one case, a man was held for over six years when the maximum sentence, if convicted, would have been 12 months. There are scores of similar cases that we're discovering around Australia, especially in Queensland, the Northern Territory, and Western Australia. And I've recently made a finding that the failure by the Commonwealth to act amounts to arbitrary detention and is inconsistent with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the Convention on the Rights of Those with Disabilities. Sadly, the response by the Commonwealth to my report that's just been tabled in Parliament is that this has nothing to do with the Commonwealth and is totally the responsibility of the Northern Territory. The second example that I wanted to look at and is much better known um, is the administrative detention power uh, through mandatory detention of those asylum seekers who arrive by boat without a visa. Australia currently detains about 5,500 asylum seekers on the mainland uh, of Australia, Christmas Island, Manus Island and Nauru, including about 730 children. We're the only nation in the world that mandates the detention of children and their families on their arrival, and we do so, do so indefinitely and on average for over a year and three months, in many very sad cases for several years, including those of ASIO, uh, um, secure, uh, those judged as, as, a, as a security risk by ASIO, held in uh, Villawood for five or six years. By comparison, for example, in the United Kingdom, a person may be held as an illegal uh, migrant, uh, an Ill illegal asylum seeker, uh, a maximum of 72 hours. Since 2010, Australia has detained literally thousands of children and their families in substandard prisons in remote and inaccessible places with little or no education, without access to legal advice for practical purposes, without criminal charge, and without a trial before a court or tribunal. 
Asylum seekers have been held in legal black holes with no idea when they can be released into the community, and the courts can find few legal bases on which to intervene. But we've recently seen, uh, at last uh, Friday, um, amendments passed to the Migration Act and the Maritime Powers Act, which achieved two important reforms. Some children, we're told by the minister, will be released from detention camps into the community, and work rights will be available to their parents on bridging visas. We don't yet know exactly which children will be released or when they will be released, but I think from the point of view of the Australian Human Rights Commission, and as you know, we've been holding an inquiry into the, uh, the physical and mental impact on children of uh, lengthy detention, uh, we, of course, are absolutely delighted to know that some children will be released. Uh, the difficulty, of course, is to know how many and that what the circumstances of their release will be. But it's also, of course, very important that their parents will have work rights on bridging visas. But what is less understood is that those two provisions, while known in the media and, and the public, I think, have brought with them a raft of other provisions which give unprecedented powers to the Minister for Immigration. Of particular concern uh, to me and to my colleagues at the Commission is that there is an explicit provision in the new amendments that if a government official fails to abide by Australia's obligation under international law or fails to ensure due process or natural justice under Australian domestic law, they will not be reasons for invalidity of the Act. In particular, of course, this means that officials can act on the high seas in ways that breach international law. In addition to this extraordinary phenomenon, I've never known, there's no precedent in Australia, and I don't know that I've ever seen one in any other legislation of a comparable legal system, where you have explicitly stated that the officials, in effect, uh, can act in an authorised way and still be in breach of the whole of domestic administrative law and of international law. But adding to this is it, that the legislation mandates that Australia's obligation not to return a refugee to the country of persecution, the principle of non refoulement which I'm sure you're familiar with, is irrelevant, says the legislation, to the power to remove a person compulsorily who doesn't have a visa. So a principle of non refoulement which has been in existence at least since the end of the Second World War as a customary rule and a treaty rule since the Refugees Convention is now irrelevant explicitly in our own legislation. Again, it appears to avoid uh, any uh, decision which has yet, of course, to be handed down by the High Court with regard to the 157 Tamils who were held on the high seas. Uh, well, we await the, the High Court's view. These amendments also give the Minister power to overturn decisions of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal that he doesn't accept. Fast-track processes are being introduced to assess refugee status, which are expected, of course, to clog up the courts with problems of legal error. There are more limited access rights to merits review. And another extraordinary phenomenon is that, while Australia has not technically withdrawn from the Refugees Convention, the Refugees Convention is no longer a point of interpretive reference for the purposes of the Migration Act. Rather, what the amendments do is to say that the international definition no longer applies, but the government's definition of its obligations to refugee replaces them. And it reminds me rather of, of Humpty Dumpty in Alice in Wonderland, who said, words mean what I choose them to mean. It seems that the minister can interpret refugee law by reference to what he thinks it means, but, but and most importantly, it will not be possible for the High Court to say that the, the Migration Act is to be interpreted by reference to the uh, Refugees Convention, because it's now being stripped out of the Migration Act. Uh, legal advice for practical purposes um, is what we know, know, know is not available. Cases are not accurately represented. Temporary protection visas that we've heard so much about uh, being gained um, on the basis of the children detained uh, may depend or do depend on ministerial discretion and may not be granted at all. Children born in Australia of, of asylum seeker parents are to be treated like their parents so that they can be transferred offshore for processing and they're barred from applying for a full protection visa. So in one uh, sweep of this legislation, introduced um, in a way that the public has little idea of what's actually being proposed, uh, 
we have deleted decades of Australian administrative law and international law. The third example concerns the counter-terrorism laws and a rapid expansion of executive discretion in these amendments. The concerns of the Australian Human Rights Commission are that any reforms should be evidence-based and necessary and proportionate to achieve a legitimate aim. Now, for the lawyers here, you'll know that that echoes the um, long traditional principles of the High Court of Australia and, of course, also of international law. Our concerns are that the amendments are, are, sle are a sledgehammer to crack a nut. They're often an overreach that invades privacy and impedes freedom of speech without appropriate judicial or external oversight. Two tranches of that legislation have now been passed, and they do modernise our anti-terrorism laws, and we needed modernisation. I think we can accept that. But the devil, as usual, lies in the detail. And it's very often the case in developing my concerns or, uh, about executive discretion and overreach is that it's not always, not necessarily one particular piece of legislation, but it's an accumulation of apparently small changes. And that is very much the case with this anti-terrorism anti legislation. Um, the Attorney General can grant ASIO questioning warrants if he's satisfied that it's reasonable to do so. But the earlier law was that he had to be satisfied that other methods would be ineffective. So you're seeing a chipping away at the normal or usual procedures in order uh, to give the attorney greater powers. Preventive detention orders, control orders, and stop search and seizure orders have all been extended, despite recommendations from the counterterrorism monitor that they're not used in practice and should be abolished. A new offence of travelling to a declared area, the first of which has just been announced, um, uh, it creates a new offence for us, and the burden of proof that a visit to a declared area was solely for a listed purpose is on the person who's being accused. While the Commission argued for a wider justification of some sort of legitimate reason for the visit to a declared area, this was explicitly rejected by the government in their memorandum um, of, uh, of, um, of understanding because the government did not want the courts to play any role in determining what legitimate means. We also have a new crime of advocacy that does not link with an act. Uh, as you know, the common law has always been extremely reluctant to impose penalties for thinking uh, or, or even talking. Uh, we usually want to see some concrete act towards achievement of the outcome. That too will now, uh, that link will now be broken and advocacy uh, of terrorism will be a new offence. Um, Ten-year penalties for disclosure of information under the now notorious Section 35P uh, of the first tranche of that legislation um, will be attracted where the disclosure prejudices the effective conduct of a special intelligence operation, regardless of any intention to do so. ASIO can share in confidential information with both Australian and overseas government agencies. Proposed amendments that will be coming up early next year allow the Minister to issue one-year warrants to access not only a computer, but the, all of the networks in relation to that computer. Now, I think we all know that every computer is linked through the internet to everything else. Uh, it's also explicitly possible to materially interfere with a computer if it's necessary to carry out the warrant. Special intelligence operations can be agreed to by the Director General of ASIO for a year and extended for another year without any external oversight. Telecommunications companies will be asked to store metadata for two years with wide rights of access uh, to other intelligence agencies here and overseas, again, without scrutiny by independent overseers. Immunity is given to ASIO agents without showing that the otherwise illegal act is necessary or that there are no alternatives. Well, these are just three examples, and I can only speak very briefly about them. But in relation to each of these areas, we're seeing what I think is a significant overreach of executive discretion without the appropriate independent monitoring or oversight by the courts. Well, how has it come to this in Australia's relatively mature and successful multicultural democracy? Why is it not possible to gain a writ of habeas corpus to examine the legality of detention? Why does the Magna Carta not apply? Well, there are at least two explanations. One is that Australia is unique in its approach to international law and human rights. The other is that the Constitution and the High Court have long recognised 
the right of the federal government to exercise its discretion to detain people for administrative purposes, in particular those with mental illness or to deal with so-called aliens. Well, firstly, what do I mean by Australian exceptionalism or unique approach to international law? And many of you will recall uh, or know from your history that Australia has been a good international citizen and very heavily involved in the development of contemporary human rights law. You might remember the, the, the feisty, argumentative, difficult but brilliant Doc Evatt who represented Australia in the negotiations for the Charter of the UN, um, but also who was the President of the General Assembly in 1948 when uh, he ensured, I'm reliably told, that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was passed without a single negative vote in 1948. Now, that, uh, uh, that declaration uh, that he played such a major role in has formed the basis for all of our contemporary human rights law. Um, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Refugee Convention, the Torture Convention, and all the conventions on race, uh, sexual discrimination, and disabilities. Um, and Australia has been a major player. We've been engaged in the drafting. We've fairly rapidly and usually signed and ratified these treaties. But sadly, Australia ha has only occasionally legislated these treaties into domestic law. They are the benchmark for the Australian Human Rights Commission, but they're not directly applicable law. So from the Commission, when we go to the High Court or we go to the public or we go to the Minister and we say um, detention of the mentally ill or of asylum seekers uh, or the arrest of people for uh, suspected terrorism um, would breach Article 9 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights dealing with arbitrary detention, reflecting the Magna Carta provision. The answer is that is not part of Australian law and never has been. So it's quite astonishing that it's very difficult to put forward these legal principles in a context when they've never been legislated into law. There are also very few constitutional protections other than the right to vote, the right to freedom of religion, and the implied right to political communication. Unlike every common law country in the world, Australia has no Bill of Rights. As a consequence, unlike New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Europe, Canada, and the United States, we do not view any legal system through the prism of human rights. But of course, in Victoria, you do, because you talk about the law by reference to all of those provisions that are to be found in your charter, and indeed in, your, in this wonderful report, in the ways in which charter provisions are relevant to the kinds of concerns that I've been expressing at the national level. I am told that when a survey was done of Australians a couple of years ago, they were asked to question do we have a constitution? To which the answer by 90% of Australians was no. When asked if we have a Bill of Rights, 60% of Australians said yes. It seems that we learn more about the law from American television programs than we do from anything else. And I was reliably informed by a New South Wales police commissioner a couple of weeks ago the man, that a man who was recently convicted of murdering his wife in Sydney on, I, I gather, incontrovertible evidence, when he was arrested by the police, asked if he could take the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> Not only do we have very few constitutional provisions at the national level, but there's little human rights legislation other than anti-discrimination laws in relation to sex, disability, and race. Age, of course, is one of those areas in which Australia genuinely leads. It's not based on a, on a convention. It's based on our own legislation. And you'll know that my colleague, Susan Ryan, uh, represents the aged in Australia uh, and has been doing an outstanding job in, in making the case for uh, non-discriminatory, particularly non-discriminatory employment practices for the aged. And finally, unlike, unlike other regions of the world, there's no overarching regional human rights framework in the Asia-Pacific unlike um, Latin America, Africa, of course the whole of Europe, and now for the Arab countries, we have no inter-regional uh, uh, inter human rights agreement that brings us together and allows us to have some kind of development of jurisprudence. So, in summary, Australia is unique. It's exceptionalist in its approach to human rights. 
but we do have an incomplete and fragile culture of human rights. And we do, in truth, get it right a large amount of the time. But how do we do it? What are our mechanisms in Australia? If we don't have the tools that other countries have, what do we have? Well, one element that I've learned is a very important one, is the notion of a fair go. It's an Australian cliche, but it makes the point that there's a cultural expectation by Australians that fundamental rights and freedoms will be respected. If you ask the woman shopping in the Burke Street Mall, does she have a right to freedom of expression? She'll say, of course she does. If you ask her what the legal foundation for that right is, she won't know. But for her, it doesn't matter. But we know that, in fact, there is no right to freedom of expression in, in the Constitution. There's an implied right of political communication, which is not quite the same thing. And if it's protected at all, it's protected because the community expects it to be protected. And we know, of course, that the media is very good at protecting it. Um, we also have common law rules of statutory interpretation and the principle of legality that our High Court uh, refers to on occasion. These principles are basically that Parliament intends to comply with Australia's international obligations and that common law freedoms should be upheld. Um, it's been described, this phenomenon of common law rules, has been described by the United Kingdom's former um, Attorney General, the Right Honourable Grieve, um, whom you might know has just resigned in, uh, from the British uh, Cabinet uh, because of, the, of David Cameron's proposal that there be a delinking of the English Human Rights Act from the European Convention on Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. But he used a very powerful phrase in a speech just a couple of days ago, and that is that the common law rules of fundamental freedoms are an almost mythic restraints, restraint on government. And indeed they are at a cultural level. There's another um, advance, I think, in Australia that, that, that has been important, and that's the Commonwealth's Joint Parliamentary Committee on Human Rights, the so-called Scrutiny Committee, which has brought in one of the most important advances in human rights protection at the parliamentary level in Australia for many years. And, of course, there is the work of the uh, human rights and anti-discrimination bodies in Victoria and throughout Australia, and, of course, the Australian Human Rights Commission that receives about 21,000 complaints a year uh, that we manage uh, through investigation and through conciliation. Uh, so you can get a level of access to social justice uh, for practical purposes uh, without any cost to, to those making a complaint or to those against whom the complaint is made and achieve a fair level of, of human rights outcome in these rather informal ways. But the fatal flaw in Australia's mixed and usually successful regime is that the common law principle of legality will be trumped by the clear words of the statute. And this reflects, of course, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. The courts are bound to apply the unambiguous words of legislation that are agreed to by an elected parliament. And on the face of it, it makes sense. Parliamentarians are elected, says the government. Judges are appointed. But I fear that it's not understood, and indeed, in my view, deliberately distorted, that an independent judiciary is an integral part of democracy. To dismiss our judges as unelected misses the point. They're one of the vital institutions of democracy and are there precisely to ensure that the executive and parliament act within the constitution and the rule of law. The consequence of the ad hoc and mixed means of achieving human rights outcomes in Australia is illustrated by some recent events. You'll be aware that leading up to the election and after the election, the now Prime Minister and the Attorney General told us how terribly important it was that freedom of speech should be protected and that it was ris at risk because journalists like Andrew Bolt could be prosecuted under the civil law prosecution in 18C of the Race Discrimination Act. No one should, says that legislation, offend, insult, humiliate uh, or intimidate a person in public because of his race or national origin. On gaining government, an exposure bill was introduced that in effect would have eliminated 18C and that attracted 5,500 responses from the Australian public, uh, most of which I am reliably informed objected to those changes to 18C. We, of course, were not able to see those uh, submissions because the government did not abide by usual practice and they were not put up on the website. I love, though, the Australian response because I think it was Monash uh, um, Human Rights Law Centre 
that found, the, of course, many of the people who'd submitted these uh, submissions were more than happy to have them in the public arena, so they gathered them together and put them up on the website. So we do know a little bit about what the public had to say. Uh, but nonetheless, two or three months ago, the government announced that the reform proposals for 18C that were so vital to protect our right to freedom of speech could not go ahead, but instead new laws would be introduced to make it criminal to advocate terrorism without the current requirement for the evidence that advocacy has had an effect in, pr in practice. So it seems that the right to freedom of speech is now to be balanced negatively against the need to protect national security. My aim today is not necessary to comment on the substantive merits of either of these legislative policies, but rather to make the point that we have few national bench uh, benchmarks of legal jurisprudence for fundamental freedoms by which to judge whether the government's got the balance right. How can a 180 degree swing in the importance of the right to freedom of speech be justified? I suggest that Australia's become like a compass that's lost its due north. We don't know what core freedoms we should be standing up for. We don't understand the balancing process between competing rights, nor the commitments that Australia has made in good faith to international law. My second explanation for why we are in such a unique position in Australia um, arises in the context again of administrative detention, detention. And that is that the High Court has long recognized the alien's power under section 5119 of the Constitution. This provision gives the executive power to detain an asylum seeker for certain purposes without judicial scrutiny. And this was confirmed in a, a decision of the High Court in Lim's case in 1992 and it concerned uh, the, some Cambodians who fled the civil war in their country, during which 25% of the population was killed. They arrived in Australia by boat without a visa, but the High Court confirmed that the executive could detain an alien in order to remove him from Australia or to determine his eligibility for a protection visa, and that this executive discretion does not usurp the Chapter 3 uh, constitutional provisions that reserve under the principle of the balance of power uh, of the separation of powers, the judicial powers of the court. Well, just for a moment, if you'll bear with me, it's worth having a look at Justice McHugh's majority in that case, because he looked at the laws in the 16th and 17th century, and especially during the American Revolution in the 18th century, when he, he, he pointed out that it was common for the English Parliament to pass what are called bills of attainder and bills of pains and penalties. Now, some of you from if you went to law school, will remember these, but you've probably forgotten what they are, and I certainly had till I read the judgment. But he points out very helpfully that the bills gave the executive the power to inflict punishment, execution, and imprisonment without a judicial power. But by the 19th century, it was accepted that such bills are not valid because the doctrine of separation of powers among the executive, legislative, and judicial arms of government means that punishment may be imposed only after a trial with the usual procedural protections in a judicial proceeding. If detention is for legitimate, non-punitive, essentially administrative purpose, it's valid. So detention of those unfit to plead because of mental illness, or accused persons before their trial, or aliens prior to deportation or the grant of a visa, can be valid, so long as the aim is not penal or punitive. The validity of detention under executive discretion has been adopted in Australia with distressing results. The notorious example being the al Kateb decision by the High Court in 2004. The majority held that the unambiguous terms of the Migration Act, that they felt they couldn't go beyond and look to common law rules, the ambiguous terms allowed the minister to hold al Kateb indefinitely and at that time for four and a half, nearly five years, with no end in sight. He was stateless, he couldn't be held anywhere else. It was a low point in Australian human rights law. The dissenting judges took a different view. Justice Kirby, you won't be at all surprised to know, said that the law was a violation of the principle of liberty. The Chief Justice Gleeson, and rare in a way to have a Chief Justice in the minority on this matter, and Justice Gummo read it down or, and in the interest of practicality. But al Kateb has remained the law for the following 10 years and has underpinned the long-term detention of asylum seekers. But that is until a month ago. In a rather drearily named case, Plaintiff S. Floor, 4. This plaintiff was stateless, he met the definition of refugee, and he'd been held again in closed detention in Villawood for two and a half years. But this time, a different High Court made a unanimous, rare, unanimous decision that the executive discretion 
of the immigration minister to detain was confined to two purposes, either deport, which you can't do if they're stateless, or you allow them to apply for a visa. And for the first time, the court articulated a condition on the power. It said that the Migration Act does not authorize the detention of an asylum seeker at the unconstrained discretion of the minister. An alien is not an outlaw and can be detained only in accordance with the law. The court said the decision must be made by the minister one way or the other as soon as is practicable, but it also observed rather sternly that if the minister does not make a decision that a, an asylum seeker can, can apply for a visa reasonably promptly, it will use the constitutional writ of mandamus to make him comply with the Act. I said to a constitutional colleague of mine, and not being a constitutional lawyer myself, have I read this correctly? It looks like a veiled threat to me. And he said, well, you're incorrect because it's not a veiled threat. That is a threat. It's very, very clear. It remains to be seen how future courts will define the acceptable time for, for detention. It seems that the years of detention in which no decision is made at all will be invalid in the future and may indeed, I'd suggest, underpin the recent attempts um, uh, to gain amendments to the Migration Act. But the deliberate failure to make a decision and to detain children as leverage on average, as I've said, for a year and three or four months to gain temporary protection visas from the Senate, I believe is an egregious abuse of power and being essentially punitive usurps the judicial power of the court. In my view, detention of the current 3,500 asylum seekers on Christmas Island in the mainland, in other words, excluding Manus and Nauru, without a decision with a reasonable time as to whether they can apply for a visa, has become penal and is not protected by the executive power of administrative detention. Well, there are other aspects that are worrying, perhaps more than I have time to go in today, but just to remind you of the very high levels of secrecy that have crept into government practice. I've mentioned the 5,500 public submissions in relation to 18C. There were 5,700 submissions in relation to the Migration and Maritime Powers Act from the Australian community, but they had no impact whatsoever on the decision of the government to go forward with their amendments. There's no or very little information about Operation Sovereign Borders and the policy of turning back asylum seeker boats, and you might know that a bill has just been introduced to completely eliminate the Office of the Information Commissioner. Appointments to tribunals and commissioners are made without open process or are not made at all, and reform bills are rushed into Parliament before Christmas with unseemly haste in a context in which the relevant committees have little time to consider public, uh, uh, public submissions. But largely, I think, the public is oblivious to the magnitude of these practices or the consequences for their private lives but it hasn't escaped the notice of the international community. And the international legal community is increasingly concerned at this quite exceptional behaviour by Australia. But last week, in particular, the Committee Against Torture reported that it was concerned that detention is mandatory for unauthorised arrivals, including children, despite the legal principle that detention should be a last resort. It was concerned at the harsh conditions in processing and re regional processing centres where conditions for children were, I quote, uh, uh, included overcrowding, inadequate health care, and even allegations of sexual abuse and ill treatment. The United Nations Committee even, and it very unusually, commented on the bill to amend the Migration and Maritime Powers Act, as it then was, of course, to say that it was of great concern to that committee. As I said, Australia has traditionally been a good international citizen and in recognition of this is presently the President of the United Nations Security Council. But our Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, wants us to be elected now to the United Nations Human Rights Council for 2011. Australia has never been on the Human Rights Council and I believe, historically, it deserves to be a member. But it will not be lost on the international community that Australia's detention policies across the board are out of line with international treaty obligations and accepted practices of other states. So in conclusion, for the most part, we have a high standard of human rights in this largely cohesive country, but we have some blind spots. Indigenous policy that I haven't talked about today, immigration detention, detention of juveniles in, in adult prisons that I know you've been dealing with here in Victoria, and the prolonged detention of those with mental illness. What is to be done about the failure to recognize international human rights 
or indeed our ancient and fundamental common law freedoms. Imagine for a moment if our senior politicians insisted on fundamental freedoms for all and on human rights for all those we detain, as required by our treaties. Then we would have a very different landscape than exists today. But to the extent that we do not have that leadership, I believe we have to start at the beginning with including more comprehensive education at schools and universities, even of our parliamentarians, so that they can better protect and understand our freedoms. I believe that the increasing power of the modern state to intrude into people's lives requires legislation to protect citizens. I think we need to reopen the national public debate about some legislated form of human rights charter to ensure that neglected freedoms are better understood and that where freedom is necessarily limited, we're in agreement upon the principles by which to determine if the limit or balance is fair, proportionate and reasonable. And indeed, I think the example that Victoria is leading in developing jurisprudence in this area should provide some comfort to others in the, in the rest of Australia uh, that the sky won't fall in, that in fact they're very important core principles that the rest of Australia uh, could benefit from. Australia is sadly out of step with comparable legal jurisdictions in its failure adequately to protect our fundamental freedoms and its failure to meet international human rights obligations. We need to do much better if we're to sustain our multicultural and generally harmonious community. But we must not remain silent in the face of a challenge of executive power that's unprecedented and I believe is a genuine threat to Australian democracy. Thank you very much.